All right. Uh, Miss Analia, as you know, has put us in a, set us an impossible task. And when she told me to teach the entire Cold War in one lesson, I thought it's impossible. But then I thought many people have been told things are impossible. Oppenheimer was told something was impossible. You know what he was told was impossible? Splitting the atom, right? Einstein was told that. Everybody was told these things. I'm not putting myself in that category, but this is a pretty tall task. In 1961, John F. Kennedy said something. He said, you know what he said in 1961? The US would be where by the end of the decade? Yeah, not only in space, but where, do you think? On the moon. Right after Gagarin went around in orbit and everybody was saying, oh, the US is behind. He said, we'll be on the moon by the end of the decade. And we were on the moon by the end of the decade. You know what they said? The US would never open relations with China, right? Since 1949, when the Chinese won the, the Civil War, that we would never have relations with communist China. But Richard Nixon opened up relations with communist China in 1972. You know what they said? The Berlin Wall that went up in 1961 would never come down. It would divide Germans forever. But you can listen to a Scorpion song if you want from like the late 1980s, early 90s. You don't even know who the Scorpions are. But they have a great song called Winds of Change. And when Mrs. Abizade and I were hiding from my mother-in-law at the bar the other night as Charlie was at tennis practice. And I said, Mrs. Abizade, this is our chance to have a beer away from the mother-in-law. And we went in to Belfast Pub in Akwati, and Winds of Change was on. And Mrs. Abizade grew up at that time in the Soviet Union. So that's not impossible. When I was your age, they said, you will never marry someone from the Soviet Union. And I would say, thank God, because there are only two types of women from the Soviet Union. The hideous, fat babushka with ankles that are swollen so much, I don't know why they wear shoes that tight, right? They wear shoes tight, their ankles are swollen out the side. And then you have the temptress, the Soviet spy, working for the KGB, which is the Committee for Government of Bezapasnosti, which means uh, security. Or she's a double agent, working for the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. Or she's a triple agent, working for the KGB, working for the CIA, working for the KGB. Or She's a quadruple agent working for the, or she's a Chinese agent or a Cuban. And that's, a, that's your introduction to today's class. It is the Cold War, cat out of the bag, we won. Who won? Starbucks, McDonald's, Burger King, the green American dollar, freedom of speech, and the enlightenment. Is that clear? So if any of you guys go to university and your professor says, I'm a Marxist historian, can you just raise your hand and say, get with the time? Right? Marxism was cool in the 1940s and 50s after who won World War II? You know who won World War II? Who won? The Soviet Union, right? It was cool in some places to be a Marxist, and we'll talk about that. But Marxism has had its day, and that day is gone. Now is the day of globalization, and you can criticize it, but I think this school is pretty good being taught in English rather than Russian, don't you? I think this school is pretty good being taught in English rather than German, don't you? Right, all right, let's continue. All right, so today, we have a tall task. It's the Cold War. In Russian, they say, right? It's cold. Why did Himmler say it is cold? What is the definition of a Cold War, which he didn't give a citation for, but I guess he came up with it. Yeah, uh, not named Shazam Zweita, yes. <laughs> I'm going to give you my definition of a Cold War. That, that's his definition, right? It is a, based on propaganda. It is an ideological struggle. It is an economic and ideological struggle between two superpowers. I'm not even going to say influence. I'm going to say a different word. Not for influence in the world, but what do you think? Not even, they're not trying to influence. What are they trying yeah, for power in the world. Give me a better. Give me a better word that begins with a D. When you domination. domination for a domination in the world. Okay, so you get the sense. Yeah, e economic and ideological struggle between two superpowers for domination in the world. And then JM later you can plug in whatever you want. Economic domination, 
military domination, education domination, language domination. But many times you hear influence. But a lot of people died during the Cold War, and I think that's mostly for domination rather than influence. There was never a direct fight between the Soviets and the United States, but they fought proxy wars, P-R-X-O-Y, Korean War, a proxy war, Vietnam, a proxy war, Nicaragua, which he might have brought up, I watched that video, a proxy war, Afghanistan in the 1980s is a proxy war. That's a war where either the, the US is on the ground and the Soviets are supporting the other side financially and militarily, or the Soviets are on the ground and the US is supporting financially or militarily. That's a proxy war. But how did we get there? This is a question in DPIP, IB, B, whatever it is. DPIB, Diploma, DP, program, IB. They love this question. How did superpower friends become Cold War enemies, right? And if you followed along, I'll fill in some blanks here. Remember World War II? Remember that guy named Hitler? trying to mess up the whole economic system of Europe, right? And you know that the British and the Soviets and the US, they don't like when one country dominates the economic system of Europe unless it's who? Them, of course, not the Germans. So we defeat Germany with the help of the Soviet Union by 1945. But even before the end of the war, they're already jockeying for position. Okay, you know in basketball, when the shot goes up, you might be, you know, it's your buddy. When I play with Mr. A, when that shot goes up, you know Mr. A? He's, he's like strong from here, well, all the way through here. That shot goes up, boom, he knocks me to the side and gets the rebound. It's called jockeying for position. Marriage is the same thing in the first couple of years. Just so, just so you know for my three viewers at home, don't worry, do it, it's worth it. <coughs> oh, I almost choked, okay, let me continue. That was, that was just silly jokes right now for the people at home. Get married. It's like the US and the Soviets were married during the war, right? <laughs> Sometimes you have a marriage like that. No, you do. Sometimes you have a marriage. As long as you have an outside enemy, everything's fine. Or children, right? <laughs> then once the children go to university, the parents kind of look at each other like, oh, oh, now I have to talk to you, right? I, I can make this connection between marriage and children in the Cold War because uh, assume like the woman is the Soviet Union. We'll just call it that, okay? And the man is the United States and there's a child. There's a couple children. Sometimes we try to turn them against the other side a little bit. Right? We are also vying for certain amounts of influence. None of us actually whisper in their ear like I love you more than the other one. That would be totally inappropriate. But when push comes to shove, we need them on our sides. Every now and then, RD, you get one of these kids, non-aligned. <laughs> Do you know what a non-aligned kid is? Just goes his own way. Doesn't want to play basketball with me. Doesn't want to learn about baseball. He wants to like play the violin or something, right? So. <laughs> And then doesn't want to do the stuff that the, the Soviet, excuse me, my wife uh, wants him <laughs> to do, right? Uh, and they're called non-aligned states. The big ones that you need to know are Egypt, India. Those are the two big ones. They brought up Indonesia, too. And we'll talk about non-aligned states. So you have these two huge superpowers, the US, and the, United, uh, the US and the USSR. And then you have a bunch of non-aligned states. And then you have a bunch of states that are aligned with one side or another for a variety of reasons. And those are your themes for like AP history, as you know, for economic reasons, for security reasons, for development reasons, who's getting money, who's building roads, who's building schools. All right, 1945, it breaks down, but Tehran happened in before 1945. Tehran is a conference between what they call the big three. Uh, you don't get much bigger than this. It's not Biden, Zelensky, and uh, whoever's the leader of England now, right? Uh, I know who the leader is, I think. They've been changing a lot. <laughs> it's Churchill. Remember him? Okay, misogynist somewhat, but everybody was back then. Alcoholic, but listen, don't drink. But if you're fighting against the Nazis and you want to tip back a couple of whiskeys during the day, I think it's okay, right? If you're being bombed in the Blitzkrieg and you want to have a drink, that's fine. The leader of the US, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, he's, he is disabled, if that still is a word. But because we weren't so inclusive back then, the government and the media said, we're not gonna show him in a wheelchair. Does anybody know why? Like now that he would be paraded around and be celebrations and parades and everything. But people were a bit different back then, or at least that's what they thought. Why, RD? Uh, it would have to be weak. Yeah, it would be a sign of weakness, they thought, 
right? So therefore, FDR was not shown in the wheelchair. They would cover over the wheelchair with, or with a blanket, or he's many times so, uh, shown seated uh, in Congress and other places. And then the third one is JS. Who's JS? Stark. He's dapper. I mean, if you, if, you, if you look at the great hair, I'll say good things about Stalin. I will sometimes, right? I went to a Stalin museum once, and there was a, a bust, which is like from the head up statue of Stalin, and the hair I should show you. If you look good in a statue, if your hair looks good in a statue, it's unbelievable. I've only seen a couple pull it off. Alexander the Great, you're going to see a statue with his hair. It's like you want to touch the statue hair. And then you have uh, Stalin, just unbelievably thick, beautiful Georgian hair. He's dressed nice. They're all smoking cigarettes. Look at me, don't smoke cigarettes. They're all smoking cigarettes because they were in a war and that's what people did. They're jockeying for position. Does anybody know what they're concerned about? Are they concerned about Southeast Asia? No. A little bit, but not much. What are they concerned about? Uh -huh. Europe, and there's one city in Europe that they're definitely concerned about. Does anybody know what it is? Berlin. Berlin. Do you remember that guy Trotsky? Yeah. Remember that guy Lenin? They had this crazy idea called worldwide, worldwide Permanent Revolution. You know, and they weren't thinking about, like, let's spread it to Beijing. And they weren't thinking about, let's spread it to Hanoi. They were thinking about, let's, not even the Moscow. You know where they wanted it? Berlin. Remember Karl Marx? Yeah. German, right? Do you remember the industrial center of Europe? Germany. Do you remember where communism takes hold? Yeah, because of industri industrialization, right? And unions and all of this. So they're definitely arguing about Germany and Eastern Europe. Ah, do you know where Soviet soldiers are in 1943? Yeah, they're moving toward there. They're still fighting that way. They're not fully there, right? So Stalin has some negotiating room, but not a lot. But by the next conference in 45 in July, do you know where the Soviets are? Yeah, right. They fulfilled the Trotskyite prophecy. The Red Army, and it may as well have been Mongols. Remember the Mongols? That's what we said in the U.S. at that time. Scratch a Russian, you know what you find right underneath? A Mongol. The barbarian hordes, not the barbarian whores. Yeah, okay, not... The Ah, uh, exactly. Because my, my pronunciation is bad sometimes. And before I started pronouncing, pronouncing, it's a new word. Before I started pronouncing, <laughs> the other class I made up a new word called hopefully. I was like, hopefully it will get done. This is what happens when you intermittent fast and you don't drink water after working out for an hour playing basketball and sweating out like three kilos. So give me a break, hold on. 2014, PP class. Same lesson. And everybody laughed when I said the Russian hordes had taken over Berlin. They were now a threat to all God-fearing capitalists in the West. And they all laughed. I wonder why. I remember the Russian hordes were funny. And then about two lessons later, I said it again, and it really slipped out in Boston dialect, right? I went full, I went full on like North Shore, where I'm from in the, I'm from the Peabody, Massachusetts. <laughs> Wicked. North Shore, and I said the Russian, I said the Russian hordes, and, uh, and I was like, wait a minute, did you think I said Russian hordes? I'm like, yeah, isn't that what you said? Everybody woke up at that point, and they were writing down, they, they were like, oh my God, some of the boys were like, oh, this is going to be awesome, right? The Russian hordes have finally, like, taken over. No, it's hordes. Does anybody know what hordes mean? Like, crazy big groups of Mongols and other barbarians. That's how we viewed the Russians at that time, even though they were our allies. And at Potsdam in July, here it is. You already have American troops in Berlin. You have French, not the Vichy ones, not the ones who joined the Nazis, right? They lost out. You have British troops there, and you have Soviet troops there. It's broken down into four sectors, right? Eventually, it's broken down into two sectors, the Soviet sector uh, and the United States sector. Now, I'm biased, but I think the US sector is better. The German sector has like the worst, po I mean, the, the Soviet sector is eventually going to have the worst made cars ever in the history of industrialization. It's going to have pollution, bad food, maybe decent education, though they did kind of, they did math fairly, fairly well. The western side of Berlin 
is going to have freedom of speech, good education, McDonald's, and other things that we love uh, in the West. But that's at Potsdam. They haven't determined that yet. But at Potsdam, there's a new president. His name is Truman, right? FDR died in April. And just a side note, when FDR died in April, uh, Hitler, who if you, I don't know if you knew this, but he was an occultist who believed in astrology and all these things. He thought it was a sign from the stars and the gods that Germany was going to win World War II when FDR died. Truman came in. He was a nobody. People didn't really know him, uh, even though he was a senator. But back then, they didn't have Twitter, right? They didn't have 24-hour news. So most people knew us, like, who is this guy? He was the vice president in 44. Before that, he was a senator. Before that, he uh, was from Missouri. He was a veteran from World War I. Uh, supposedly, he had never succeeded at anything in his life except becoming president. That was according to his mother-in-law, right? Uh, his mother-in-law said he was always a failure. But as president, he was bad A-double-S-S. And when he went to Potsdam, in the middle of the conference, it was like a week-long conference, in the middle, somebody came up and whispered in his ear, we got a, you know what we got? We got a bomb. Oh, imagine that. You're in one of your inclusion sessions, right? Being nice to every different ethnic group at IICS. And then someone from Bolivia or Argentina comes up in your ear and says, by the way, we have a human destroying device that can make us dominate the entire world. You'd have to be really open-minded at that moment, not to like just stand up and start dancing on the desk going, I got a bomb, I got a bomb, I got a bomb. Truman didn't do that. He played it cool, right? But he started demanding things. Do you know what he was demanding in Eastern Europe? What was he demanding? Free elections. Free elections. Americans love free elections, just for the record, unless the communists win, okay? So we, there's like fine print in that. If the communists win an election, then it's kind of like, Right? So free elections as long as who we want to be the leader gets elected. And on the off chance the guy that we want doesn't get elected, sometimes there's a coup d'etat or an overthrow of the government, and then the guy that we wanted kind of gets in there. We didn't have anything to do with it. It was like a miracle, right? And then we get our guys around the world. So Potsdam, July, free elections, and Stalin's like, yeah, maybe, right? Perhaps. 